Sometimes as a lesson continues on and enters into the second hour, as all the oxygen is consumed and temperature rises and people start dropping off like flies, already we've lost a quarter of our audience and we're not even started yet in our lesson. <clears throat> but hopefully, if you'll give serious attention to the things that we have to say this evening, we have the full assurance that what we're going to be examining is straight from God's Word, and we know, therefore, if we handle it correctly, it will be beneficial to us. And if it is beneficial to us, it will benefit us, not only while here we are upon this earth, but in preparation for an eternity above. It's sort of difficult to just listen to the reading of our devotional reading a few moments ago in Isaiah chapter 1. Because as you hear a prophet of God speaking concerning worship practices, and they are in actuality worship practices of God's people, at once you are caught by surprise when, in the very first verse of our devotional reading, he makes mention of the children of Israel in the terms Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, He's making a comparison of God's people to those two infamous cities that were destroyed by God with fire a number of years previous to this because of the prevalent sin of homosexuality. Now, if you were going to try to get an Israelite's attention, then if you can't get it with something like that, then you can't get it. But reckon it got the attention of as many as it should have. Well, we don't really know. But we know that there was not a whole lot of those who heard the cry of repentance that we see throughout this book that took it to heart, or else they wouldn't have been going into captivity a few short years later. The northern kingdom, of course, was taken away into captivity by the Assyrians because of their rebellion, disobedience to God taken upon themselves the heathen practices of their religious neighbors and as they incorporated the sons and the daughters of the religious neighbors as their sons-in-law and daughters-in-law, then they simply brought those practices home with them and thus they were taken into captivity. And you would think that that would be an object lesson that would get their attention. And yet, no, only a few short years later, the southern kingdom of Judah following the same course of action, or maybe better, inaction, did exactly the same thing, intermarried with a heathen, had half heathen grandkids, and thus the trail was paved while it was looked upon by some as good intentions. It could have been said that the road to torment is paved with good intentions. But what we read in this first chapter of the book of Isaiah is basically just typical of not only the nation of Israel during that time, but humanity before that time. Even prior to, of all things, the law of Moses. Prior to this nation of people who were the descendants, of course, of Abraham through Isaac through Jacob, this faulty way of doing things is something that not only predated the Mosaic economy and was typical of many people that we'll look at some examples in the patriarchal age here in a few minutes, but also is a problem that we read about after the establishment of the Lord's Church in Acts chapter 2. And then, lo and behold, you would think that when you have so many examples of this very flaw in humanity in the patriarchal age, and then you see that basic flaw in humanity in the Mosaic Age, and then that flaw in the Christian Age in the pages of the New Testament, then humanity would learn the lesson and would not be guilty of that sin ever again. Wrong. That's not the way it is. The one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Right? Well, very seldom do we learn the lessons of history. Even though, as we've noted this morning, our devotional reading was, or our uh, verse to remember, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. What was the problem 
basically here in Isaiah chapter 1. I guarantee you, there were those who would hear the words of this first chapter, and they would begin to think and maybe even pull at their hair and say, what's going on here? I mean, we're offering the right sacrifices. We know just exactly what God requires. We know what has been written. We know what has been preached. We know what has been taught. That's what we're doing. We know the exact day upon which these sacrifices are to be offered. And that's what we're doing. We know when we're supposed to assemble. And that's when we're assembling. We know the way that we're to word our prayers. And that's the way we're wording our prayers. What's the problem? Has God changed His mind? Does He no longer want these specific sacrifices at these specific times? No, it was just overlooking one little minor problem. And that is, while they were doing the right thing, for some reason, the terminology here used would lead, to, lead us to conclude that there was something terribly lacking in their attitude, even though their actions in regards to worship anyhow were correct. And so that calls to mind, at least to me, a statement made by Jesus as He talked to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. You remember, here Jesus is stopping to refresh Himself. He comes upon a woman, a Samaritan woman of all things, who is there at Jacob's well as well. And when He begins to start a conversation with her, she is at once amazed. Not only that here is a male that's talking to her, but a Jewish male that's talking to her. And that just did not happen. And of course, as the conversation went on, of course, and this woman found out real quick, this was not just any old man, and this was not just any old male Jew. Because this man knew everything about her. And so she changed the conversation to the matter of, where is the right place that we ought to be worshiping anyhow? Don't ask me any more about these men that I've had problems with. I know the man that I'm living with now is not my husband. Uh, but where should we worship? Now, we Samaritans say that it's in Mount Gerizim that we're supposed to worship. And you Jews say, no, that's not the right place. That Jerusalem is the right place to worship. Which one's right? And of course, Jesus responded to her question by saying, well, Samaritans have got it wrong. The Jews do have it right. And of course, that's by the Old Testament Mosaic economy that there was where worship was to be offered in the Mosaic age by those who were living in that covenant. But then Jesus makes this affirmation. He says, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now, don't you that phrase there? The true worshiper is a specific type of worshiper that I want to be. And the true worshiper, the specific type of worshiper that I want to be, is the worshiper that worships the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, what was happening back over here in Isaiah chapter 1? Were they not worshiping God according to divine dictate? relative to the things that they were doing, the time that they were doing, and all that. Yeah. Well, why didn't God accept their worship? Because there's more involved in being a true worshiper than just doing the right things at the right time. There was a little bitty part there that was overlooked. That's worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. You see, that's always been a problem. But the problem is just one of many in that people have the tendency to make a big deal out of and grasp tightly to one thing while paying little heed, if any, to something that's directly connected to it. Now, we know that there are people who do the very opposite, going in the very opposite direction. 
Instead of being concerned with all the particulars of worship, I mean, what you do and where you do it, oh, the main thing is just to feel good about it. And that will take care of all the failings to follow God's will, right? No, that's just in the other ditch. And there is no reason for us to be in either ditch. Why is that? It's because the true worshiper worships the Father, not just in spirit, and not just in truth, but in spirit and in truth. And that's not what Israel was doing in Isaiah chapter 1. As a matter of fact, back in the second and third verses of Isaiah chapter 1, God through Isaiah designates just exactly what their problem was. The ass knows his, knows his owner, and the ox is Master's crib, but my people does not know. My people do not consider. You see, here were people who knew the right sacrifices to offer at the right time, but were ignorant of God. And folks, you cannot worship a God you don't know. It can't happen. You cannot be a true worshiper worshiping a God that you are not in fellowship with, that you do not know, that you're not friends with, that you're not on the same page with. And Israel was. Because I guarantee you, if they'd been on the same page with God, then God would not have said through His prophet, you're Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what y'all are like. Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's see if we can get your attention. You're like Sodom and Gomorrah. We're worshiping at the right time. We're offering the right sacrifices, but where is your heart? What's your motivation? Isn't it interesting that here in these last few verses that Gabe read for us, he's calling upon them for basic morality problems of oppressing the poor, of shedding the blood of the innocent, could there ever be a period of time in which people would think that they could take advantage of their fellow man and yet march into church services with the very best press clothes on and offer up worship unto God and be a true worshiper? No way. It's not going to happen. It didn't then, and it's not going to today. You cannot substitute doing the right things in worship for a life that's given to the devil, nor one that does not concern itself with the need of those that are around about you. And that's the lesson of Isaiah chapter 1. Now, interestingly, later on in this same book of Isaiah, we find in verse 6 a picture that is given us of heavenly worship. And instead of it being an example of something that we can all learn from from our own participation in, it is something that shows us some principles that no doubt would benefit each and every one of us if we were desirous of being a true worshiper. Here is a picture. Here is the train of God that fills a temple. There are angelic beings that are in this temple. These angelic beings have three sets of feet or hands. And with these three sets of feet or hands or wings, then he's grasping, he's flying, he's standing. And he's also speaking with his mouth and saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of glory. And at the sound of this voice and the train of God filling the temple, and the smoke billowing and the foundation shaking, Isaiah looked at that and said, Man, I left my movie camera at home. No. He says, Boy, this would be a good time for me to show how well I can sing. Give me a microphone. And that's no way he does. What's he doing? He says, Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. And you know what? 
Everybody that I run around with is just as bad off as I am. And here I have been eyewitnesses to the God of glory. Now, I'm going to tell you that this fellow right here, Isaiah, is a picture of a true worshiper. In that, number one, he recognizes his own littleness. At the same time, he recognizes God's greatness. I use the example sometimes from the song at the cross. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, did my sovereign die? And then uh, would he devote a, such sacred head for such a worm as I? And the idea that is expressed by Isaiah is that. For such a worm as I. Let me tell you something. Until a person recognizes his position of undeserving of God's grace, he can't be a true worshiper. Until a person realizes that God does not owe them anything, that everything that they have is a benefit and a blessing of His grace, then he can't be a true worshiper. But when a person does see that as factual, and that is factual, then there's all types of opportunities for growth to result in being a true worshiper. Because as Isaiah 6 continues, there is a call that goes out from the throne of God saying, here's some work that we want done. Who will go? Who can we send for us? And remember what Isaiah said, don't you? Isaiah said, we've got elders. Send them. He says, well, what's the preacher for? Send him. No. He says, well, you know, I've got a 60, 70 hour a week job. There's plenty of people here who don't do nothing else all the time except sit around and watch television. Send them. There's no way to do it. He says, here am I. Send me. Now, this would be completely ridiculous for somebody to say, that an understanding of what true worship is will result in 100% faithfulness. That'd be wrong. That would be too easy. And it simply would not be factual in, in expressing all that needs to be fixed oftentimes. But I guarantee you this. A person who realizes his littleness and God's bigness who knows that the very air that he breathes is a blessing and a benefit from God's wonderful grace, when he recognizes that he can be a true worshiper and is willing to participate in being a true worshiper, you're not going to have to hold a gun on him to get him to come to the services when he feels all right. Nor if he's got a hangnail in one. Here am I. Send me. Wasn't enough to just be all emotionally involved in things. Wasn't enough just to do all the right things. It had to be a blending of the two. But you know what? That's the way it is in many other affairs of life. For example, in Romans chapter 10, Paul said, beginning at verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God. Now, wait a minute. Here were people that Paul says right off the bat. Here were his Jewish brethren still practicing Judaism, who were zealous. That's right. They were on fire in what they were doing. They were avid. They were at it. They were going. Yeah. Well, that's all that's required. Isn't it? I mean, if a person is excited and, and zealous in the pursuit of God, well, just get out of their way and let them alone. That's all that matters. Remember, that's all that it mattered with Paul. 
There's old Saul of Tarsus. I mean, he's got letters from the religious leaders in Jerusalem, and he's got letters whereby he can go to Damascus and he can bring back men and women bound because they're Christians. And he's zealous. And as he stands there and he takes care of the coats of those who are stoning Stephen to death, he does so zealously believing he's doing the right thing. Let Saul of Tarsus alone. He's zealous. Well, we need more zealous people, right? Well, what about those old 18 guys that flew into various places here in the United States of America on September 11th a few years ago? Would you say those were zealous guys? Well, just leave them alone. They're zealous. They think they're doing the right thing. Oh, it's so wonderful to see somebody really on fire for what they believe in. Yeah. There's more involved than just zeal, isn't it? Paul said his heart's desire was not that you'd just be zealous, but that zeal would be coupled with knowledge. Zeal without knowledge results in fanaticism. Results in people flying jumbo jets into buildings. Results in Pharisees trying to kill every Christian they get their hands on. That's zeal. But it's not zeal without knowledge that God desires. It's zeal with knowledge. And the other is just as bad. Here's a person who has all kinds of knowledge. He knows he knows so many things, there's no way at all that he could ever tell everybody everything that he knows. But what's he doing with that knowledge? Keeping it a secret. Keeping it under his hat. Not going to let it out anywhere. Well, that's just the other ditch. Because knowledge without zeal is just as deadly as zeal without knowledge. Worshiping the Father in spirit without worshiping the Father in truth is just as deadly as worshiping the Father in truth without worshiping in spirit. It seems like there's something there that Jesus says in as he relates what happened back in Genesis chapter 3, in Matthew chapter 19, he says, What God has joined together, let not man put a son. Somebody says, yeah, but that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about there is a husband and a wife. I realize that. But there's also things that God has joined together that we have no right to separate to, such as zeal and knowledge such as worshiping the Father in spirit and worshiping the Father in truth. And, as in the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You see, in the marching orders of the Great Commission, Jesus joins together faith and baptism. Therefore, it would just be as wrong as it could be to try to separate those two from each other. As deadly as separating zeal from knowledge or separating worshiping God in spirit or worshiping God in truth. It could very well be that in an audience this size, there are those who have come to the realization that they need to do something about their spiritual condition and become a child of God even tonight. If you've never obeyed the simple commands of the gospel, you're outside of Christ without God and without hope in this world. That's exactly the way Paul describes such individuals in Ephesians chapter 2. But thanks be to God that just as Jew and Gentile could be brought together by one body by the cross in Ephesians chapter 2, and they could be a part of that same spiritual body, which is the temple of God, which is the church, even so is that possible tonight. Do you enjoy all the spiritual blessings that are available in Christ? If not, you can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins as a penitent believer and confessor. At the same time, the Lord will add you to His church. That is being born again, being born of water of the Spirit, the born-again process described by Jesus to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. However, the possibility always also exists that one has obeyed the gospel, but they've ceased 
walking in the light. Through repentance, confession, and prayer, the way back is provided for the heir and child of God. If you fit into that category of people who need to respond to heaven's invitation, simply make that known to us as well. While together we stand and while we're saved.